It's our final show tonight. And although we may be running out of time, we're certainly not running out of drama. It's been a grey day for our wagtails. There's been a twist in their tail and they've had a very unwelcome encounter. And we're on the Isles of Scilly, where I'm hoping to have a truly extraordinary experience. And I have an encounter that definitely gets the seal of approval. Stand by for the final showdown. It's Spring Watch. Look at this. <laughs> Just look at this. This is an intentional twirl. Look at that. Oh, I might join in then. <laughs> I don't care if I have made a fool of myself. It's a tremendous evening for our final spring watch of 2017 on the Sherborne Park Estate up here in Gloucestershire. 4,000 acres managed by the National Trust. We came up here with a different sort of mission altogether and we found a lot of wildlife, Michaela. We have, Chris, but let me tell you, we were hoping to have a calm end to the series but we've had a bit of a drama today and it's in our great wagtail nest. Let's go to it live right now. And as you can see, this gorgeous little nest is now empty. Did they fledge? Well, I'm afraid to say no, they didn't. They were too young to fledge. This is what happened. There are the five chicks all sitting there. 9.35, a jay comes in. Easy pickings for a jay and it immediately takes one off. You saw one escape to the side. So now there are three left in the nest. Mum comes back. At this stage, she doesn't appear to notice that she's only got three chicks, feeds one of them and is off again. 11.13, that jay comes back. This is exactly what happens once they know where the nest is. It's like a larder. Easily takes that chick off. Fourth chick manages to escape goes down in those brambles at the side. We thought it might have gone into the water, so we sent our cameraman off. He managed to spot it. For the moment, it was safely resting in the branches. One chick left. Mum comes back, wagging that tail furiously. Dad's on high alert in the tree, so at this stage, they know what's going on. They can see that there's only one chick left. What happened then? Well, the female hung around, looked for the other chicks. And then at 6.08, hours later, which is quite surprising, the jay came back and took that final chick. Oh, what a shame, eh? I mean, a real drama today. There were five chicks, three got eaten, to escape, but I don't know, they were too young to fledge. What's going to happen to those? Well, they Chris? were too young to fledge. I mean, if they find a nook in the wall, which in effect will act as a nest, the parents will continue to take food back to them. That's the, the one hope. Do you know what I think this, though, really highlights, Michaela, is that just how difficult it is to live mm. and survive out here, and certainly when it comes to reproducing, you know, those wagtails in and out all the time, drawing attention to that nest. They've got no choice. They've got to be in and out, taking the food there, but the keen eye Jay ha has spotted it. That jay did have keen eyes. The blackbird that we've been watching, the male, not so keen eyes. In fact, it's got a damaged eye. It's blind in one eye and we were worried that it wouldn't survive long enough to fledge its own chicks. The nest is about 800 metres over in that direction. We can go to it live now and it too is empty. But I've got to tell you, it's good news this time because earlier today the five chicks in this nest did successfully fledge. Started early, about 7.30 this morning. The first one made its way out into the bush. I mean, frankly, they're too big for the nest at this stage now. They don't have any choice but to get out of it. And over the course of the morning, the rest of those birds left. But when you see the last one perched on the side here, look, no tail, no length to the wing feathers. This is not a bird that can fly at all. And there's a very good likelihood that they're going to end up on the ground. And that's typical of the thrushes. If you're out with your dog walking through the park, you might notice that you'll flush quite a lot of young blackbirds and song thrushes at this time of year. And they do end up down on the ground. Vulnerable to ground predators, of course, and in urban situations, cats, but enough of them get through. And that one-eyed male has done his duty. He's got at least some of his genes, hopefully at this point, into the next generation. So, Chris, we've got an empty grey wagtail nest. We've got an empty blackbird nest. We've only actually got one 
nest left of the little birds, which is our swallows. So let's have a look at them. Did they go? No, they didn't. We thought they might. They're ready to fledge and as you can see, they're very squashed in that nest. I love their little faces. I know we see them all the time. They just look like grumpy old men, don't they? But we're going to keep our eye on that nest throughout the show because they could go this evening, more likely they'll go tomorrow. You can keep your eyes on them too if you like. You can, our camera's up live, of course, on the web, on the internet. If you've got a tablet or a phone alongside, you can be watching those as well. We've been watching a great range of species since we turned up here on day one. The first birds we were looking at, paradoxically, were a nest full of jays, all rooting for them at that time, of course. But, you know, we've been following the fortune of 81 eggs. Only eight failed to hatch. Then we had 73 youngsters, of which 44 fledged. Only 12 so far have failed. So 44 out of 81 is about 50% of the young that we've been watching in those nests has fledged. And I know that sounds like only half a success, but that's still pretty good, you know. I love all those pictures there. If we, if we turn them all round, could mm -hmm. you name the top row? It, had I looked at them and not been talking about them, <laughs> I, I probably could. I've got that sort of mind, yeah. <laughs> Great to see them all, and as Chris said, 44 fledged. And do you know, this year we've actually had less predations than we normally have on Spring Watch. So let's celebrate the ones that made it. I want to break free. Great to see all those little birds break free. Puts a smile on your face, doesn't it? But it's not just birds we've been following. We've been looking at mammals too. And plenty of you have been enjoying our stoat family. We've been following the stoat family. They were about eight to 10 weeks when we first met them. They've all grown. And as you can see, they're pretty much adult size now. They've even got the black tip on the end of their tail. Probably about 12 weeks old by now. And at this stage, they'll start to disperse from their mother and from each other. The females tend to stick around near to their birthplace, but the males will go up to 20 kilometers away. But I've got, I've got a graph, Chris. I've got a graph to show you. Oh, this is my graph. stoat appreciation graph. And this is how interested people were to begin with, stoatally uninterested, which actually I don't believe. And then look, it went right up here. They're really popular. They're stoatally amazing at the end. That's a cool graph, isn't it? What, what, do you like it? How come you get a graph with a tail on? It's the tail end, isn't it? It's the tail end of my graph. <laughs> I've been working on this programme for, I don't know, quite a few years, have that privilege. I've never had a graph with a tail on like that before. <gasps> You're just jealous. I'll give me my graph back. <laughs> I think I might be taking that graph home, actually. Now, if you've been watching the series, you'll know that Martin's been roaming the UK looking for different wildlife. This week he's been down in the Isles of Scilly. The question is, what is he going to get up to today? Welcome to the fabulous Isles of Scilly on what's basically a perfect evening. I can see Bishop Rock Lighthouse over there and 28 miles over there is Land's End. It's absolutely glorious out here. Now just to remind you, the Isles of Scilly are an archipelago, difficult word to say, of about 145 islands. Five are inhabited by human animals and all the others, well not all of them, but many of them inhabited by animal animals. Why? Because it's perfect. But seabirds come here to nest, there's no predators out on the islands. And the island that we're actually on now is St Agnes. You can just see the slip there. We're on the other side of the island. Now one of the thrilling things to do if you come out here to the Isles of Scilly is to go out on an island sea safari. And I did exactly that a couple of days ago. Now, when you go out on a sea safari, you get the full benefit of that crashing turquoise seas walloping against the great stacks of granite here. And you see lots and lots of seabirds coming and going, uh, going out to sea to collect food and then coming into their nests. And the sky is full of the cries of guillemots, gannets, razorbills, fulmers. Absolutely fabulous. Look at that turquoise sea. Oh, yes, please. Now, you'll see a lot of seabirds on those islands if you go out, but one you won't see is a fascinating bird. It's called a Manx shearwater. Now, they stay out at sea and they only come in 
as it's starting to get dark, as the sun's going down. Here they are, we filmed these just a couple of days ago. This is called a raft of Manx shearwaters. They're brilliantly adapted to being out at sea. In winter, you get them down in Brazil and Argentina, and then they fly up here. You get them on the coast, the, the west coast of the UK, and they come up here. But they'll stay out because they're quite vulnerable on land until it gets quite dark, and then you can see them, they're flying in. OK, now the question is, why are the Manx shearwaters coming all that way to these islands here? Well, we've had trap cameras out, and you can see what goes on at night. Once they come on the shore, here's one, it's raining a bit there, you probably guess what this is all about. Here's one coming up, and it's going into a hole in the ground, and of course, that's what's going on. They're nesting here. And they nest in holes in the ground, a bit like puffins. Either they dig them out themselves or they go into an old rabbit hole. But come with me. Now, what's fascinating is that if you'd come here, say, four years ago, you wouldn't have seen a single successful breeding Manx Shearwater. And it's all down to the work of the Isles of Scilly Seabird Recovery Project. And if you come up here, you can see Jacqueline, who's actually the project manager of the entire project. She's lying there. I'm going to ignore her now. No, I'm not. But hopefully she's going to show us something quite extraordinary. Let's go down here. OK, Jacqueline, are you ready? I've got to whisper a bit. Now, you've got to listen here. She's playing the call of a Manx Shearwater. This is a nest site of the Manx Shearwater. There's one underneath there. Jacqueline, now you use this to check the burrows. That's right. So, because they're nocturnal, we need to survey them some way. We play this. Oh, it now thinks I'm a Manx Shearwater. <laughs> so, by this sound, it thinks it's for another bird, and it's saying, move on, this burrow's taken. This burrow's taken. Absolutely fascinating. <laughs> so, I'll back off now, because okay. we don't want to disturb her. They can stay in there. She might stay there for maybe six days on the single egg. She's still going. <laughs> because she'll wait for her partner to come in from the sea and then take over the nesting duties. Now, once they've identified a, a, a burrow, what they need to do is have a look down there. And this is the burrow cam. Burrow could go down a metre, two metres, and they want to push down to check to see if that bird's on an egg or maybe a chick. And so you look at like that and look at the screen. It's not great quality, but you can see what the sort of thing that they see. Here we go, down the burrow cam. There's the sheer water, you can see. Now these are very, very long-lived birds. They can live for maybe ooh, 50 years or more. It's Britain's longest-lived bird, in fact, the sheer water. Absolutely amazing. Not great quality, but you get the picture. Now, how did they manage to bring the shearwaters back? Because, as I say, four years ago, there were no successful breeding birds here. Well, it's a community effort. Jacqueline got together with all the people on the island, some other, some other partners, and they got stuck into rat on a rat here. They prepared it, and in just three weeks, they got rid of every single rat on this island. And that's the only reason the shearwaters come back to breed here. Fascinating stuff. Now that, that project has also helped enormously another very specialist mammal that lives here on the Scilly Isles. And we'll have a look at that when you come back. Now many years ago, when I was a cub researcher in the BBC, I worked on Horizon. And we'd, we had to go into Porton Down Research Centre. It took us weeks to get permission. So I was rather surprised when I discovered they let Yolo Williams in. I've been lucky enough to visit some special places over the years, but this, now this is really special. I've been given rare and privileged access to Porton Down. This is the most pristine area of chalk grassland in the whole of the UK. There is wildlife everywhere here, and for a visiting naturalist, this really is paradise. 
Covering a total area of 7,000 acres, Porton Down is one of the most sensitive sites in the UK. It's been cut off from human interference for over 100 years because it's home to Britain's military research base, the Defence Science and Technology Laboratory. Can you hear that? That's one of the nicest songs you'll hear in the UK. Lovely, fluty little song. It's a woodlark. Now, really unexpected because even here, the woodlark is, is a very, very rare bird. I'm told that only one was seen the whole of last year. They're not showy birds. You know, the skylark will go up and up and up and sing. They'll just find a perch, they'll sing from that perch, but the song says it all, really. Ah, oh, beautiful. very, very careful and quite quiet here, because in front of me is a rare butterfly called the Duke of Burgundy, and this is the first time I've ever seen one. It's not very big. It's got a mixture of all brown and orange, kind of a checkerboard wings, really. And it's an ideal day for coming out to look for them, because it's a little bit cool, and what it means is that they will just sit up like this one, waiting for it to warm up before they go off and defend the territory. Now, most of the sites, they count the butterflies in tens and twenties. If you get 30, you're really lucky. Here, they count them in the hundreds. So this really is perfect habitat for this butterfly. This landscape, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like this before. They call it an antscape because it's a landscape created by ants. Every one of these lumps is a yellow meadow ant nest and they reckon that there are three million nests here which equates to 30 billion meadow ants. That is an awful lot of ants. The icing on the cake here for any bird watcher is this bird. It's the stone curlew, very, very rare breeding weed. In the whole country, there's, what, about 380 pairs? And here on Porton Down, they have roughly 5% of the whole of the UK population. This pair here, they will have laid two eggs. They've got one chick, and they're attending it pretty well. Stone curly was obviously a top priority bird here because what they've done is they've kind of scarified the land, making it ideal for nesting stone curlews. They've gone beyond that as well because all the way around these plots you've got electric fencing keeping out foxes, badgers, predators like that so that at least the eggs hatch and the young then have a chance to fledge. And since they've done that, the breeding success has been much higher. This place really is unique, and I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity to have a look around Porton Down. Yes, it's an oasis for wildlife, but I think it's so much more than that too. It's a, it's a glimpse into our past. It gives us an idea of what this part of England would have looked like a hundred years ago. And it also clearly shows that with very little human interference, wildlife will flourish. And I just hope but it's given the same level of protection for the next hundred years. I was lucky enough to go out onto Porton Down a few years ago. I saw an enormous number of short-eared owls. That is a very, very special place. Yolo I've enjoyed it, didn't he? I'm not surprised. It's fantastic. It. <laughs> now we're trying to look around all of the nests that we've been watching here on the estate. So let's go quickly to our live buzzard now to see what's happening there. And oh look. 
the youngsters there. Look at that, Michaela. I mean, there's a lot of feathers coming through on that bird now, and it's got a full crop. It's been enjoying all of the food as it's the only one in the nest. So it's nice to leave our buzzard looking fit and healthy. I'm pretty certain that one's going to fledge successfully. It's, it's been a great place, hasn't it, Sherbourne, for birds of prey. We've had cameras on four different nests. And I think my favourite here on site has to be, well, it's just behind us, actually, in the church in the village. It's the Kestrels. Let's have a look at them live for the last time before we say goodbye to them. There they are. And do you know, it's the runt that I just love in this nest. As we know, there are four of them. There. There's, oh, come on. No, I'm rooting for the, yeah, the small animal as well. Yeah, we root for the well, small you know, guy. Wow. And look, this is what's been happening to our, our little guy in there. I mean, he really is quite, he's the one on the left. You can see, and every time the adult bird comes in, his little legs take him to the front. He's not going to miss a feed. He's fighting for survival, that little guy. And every time, he seems to get something. I think he's great. I really like that little one. He's great, um, but he's also yellow. I don't know if you've been watching him on the live cams, but he's got less feathers on him, less down on him, and his skin is very yellow. And we asked a few experts why that might be, and they thought it might be the way he's processing any carotenoids in his food that gives skin colouring, or also there's a vitamin deficiency there. Oh, it could no. be that. I know. Is yeah. he going to be all right? Well, who, who knows? Who knows? I hope so, because we're actually going to keep our cameras on that particular nest, not online, but it means that we will be able to give you an update at Autumn Watch. And we also have another pair of birds uh, which have a, a smaller individual in the brood, and that's our barn owls. And they're over here. We can go live to them now. Let's see what's happening in the barn owl nest box. Well, the adult's not in attendance. This is what we've seen in the last few days. The female that's been with them has been out and will only come back when the male starts to bring food in at night. But we've been watching them very closely. Now, these animals hatch asynchronously, which means that we've got a very small one and a very large one and a middle one in between. Last night, we watched them up until 1.30 when the camera packed up, and they brought in seven prey items. And the smallest one here, you can see, is now able to swallow these small mammals, mainly voles, occasional shrews, mice, um, and it can swallow them whole. But look at that, Michaela. That really tells a story, doesn't it? Look, a descending scale of owl. That is completely bonkers, isn't it? I mean, when you see the difference in size, you just wonder how that little one's it's going to bonkers, survive. It's not bonkers, that's the strategy. The <laughs> big one is guaranteed to make it. will always get first choice on food. And, and the little one there is as a spare. But it's, what do you reckon? Well, I, th I think Kestrel, I think, has a very good chance. The barn owl, I don't know, it's just so extreme, isn't it? But again, we're going to keep our cameras on that nest, so we'll give you an update on Autumn Watch. What about our fourth bird of prey nest, though? It's the red kites. Here they are live. Now, we're so lucky to have this nest. It's actually only in 2013 they started nesting here in Sherbourne, and there are two to three pairs now. And it's a first for us. We've never had red kites before. But just look at how they've grown. We first saw them on the 20th. 24th of May. They were just three weeks old. Already though there was a lot of sibling rivalry as you can see. A lot of fighting for food and pecking each other. But as we've watched them, I mean look how much they've grown. That down feather has fallen off, the adult feathers have come through. They're actually only about 50 grams when they first hatch and then they have to get to 900 or a thousand grams before they fledge at seven to eight weeks. And we think our ones are probably only a week away from fledging now. I mean, you can see they almost look like adult birds. And this is what they were doing yesterday. There was a lot of stretching the wings, a 